Hi, this is Ben Lowell, and welcome to Back to the Bible Canada with Dr. John Newfeld. Well, today we begin a brand new three-week series, an apologetic series called Defending the Faith. So let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 to chapter 3 with a message entitled, Obliged to Defend the Faith. I have dreamt about a day when it would be impossible to live in Canada without having to decide what to do with Jesus. In order to get that to happen, Christians in our cities and towns and rural areas would have to be talking about Jesus all the time, at work, in our schools, across the back fence, in the articles we write, and among our naturally occurring friendship networks, which includes our families and friends. But all of us know a dialogue about Jesus, or a dialogue about faith, or a dialogue about the gospel is not a one-way affair. If we want an honest, open, and respectful conversation, it means we need to both speak and listen. See, all Christians want to share with others what Jesus' life and death and his resurrection means, but some people are not ready to hear, and that might be for a number of reasons. I want you to imagine the truth of the gospel as a great ancient castle. But before we can get to the castle, there are not just one, but a series of moats in the way. You can tell people that they should get to the castle and consider the castle, but they're looking at the moats and they say, those moats are uncrossable. And we correct them saying, it's not about the moats, it's it's about the castle. But all the while they're looking at the moats. Now I say this because there have been some evangelistic methods that teach that we should avoid certain questions. So when someone asks a question like, well, what about evolution? According to the people who employ these methods, They say we should find a way of steering them back to the cross. Uh, They say we should leave that for another time. Let's talk about what God has done in Jesus. Get them to the castle. Help them to understand that after they've committed their lives to Christ, there's going to be plenty of time to talk about these other matters as well. But my way of thinking is that when someone is seriously examining the faith, one must deal with the questions that people are actually asking. And what is it that people are saying? Well, they're saying, I don't trust organized religion. Or they might ask, aren't Christians intolerant of other people? Don't you condemn homosexuality? And isn't that just a way of condemning anyone who isn't like you? Or how about this? Isn't the faith the opposite of reason and evidence? And then there are other questions. Doesn't the presence of suffering argue against a good and all-powerful God? How about this concern? Is church boring? Is your church boring? And then, of course, there are people who will ask, has Christianity not been disproved? Isn't the Christian faith in decline? And with the advancement of the modern era, won't it soon be irrelevant? And then, of course, there are those who have had bad experience with Christians. I don't think I like or trust Christians. They don't seem to be the kind of people that I feel comfortable with. And then there are those who have studied history and are asking, aren't religions responsible for so much hatred? And weren't all manner of wars inspired by religion? But that's not all. Do you guys believe that anyone who isn't a part of your religion is going to hell? And I wasn't raised on religion. I just don't think it's my style. I mean, some people like religion, some others don't. Why can't we just agree to disagree? See, these are the moats that prevent someone from getting to the castle. See, remember, the castle is the gospel. It's the saving news that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that anyone who believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And somehow, I believe we're going to have to put some drawbridges across the moats. We need to help people to see that the moat is actually not uncrossable. But we have to take the moat seriously. Failure to do so will give people the impression that we don't care about them and the things that they care about. Now, behind all of this, there's an assumption. We believe that the castle is overwhelmingly attractive. If we can get people to consider coming over to the castle and and having a look and deciding they want to live there, well, that's what many simply hunger for. After all, they are created in the image of God and, and they have broken and restless hearts and a crying need to connect to their creator. But they're going to have to cross the moat to get to the castle. See, I need to say at the outset that I'm a believer in Christians forming friendship with non Christians. I believe we need to get out of our cliques and actually take the time to get to know and to love those who don't share faith with us. 
Well, that's going to include people who believe things and do things with which we do disagree. Evangelism is really a messy business, and there are times when, when those who don't do evangelism will condemn us for the kinds of friendships that we have. Now, of course, we begin by forming friendships with non-believers and by talking about our faith. See, unless we do both of these things, the moats will remain and the castle will always seem distant. Now, I remember some time ago having a conversation with a Christian that went like this. The Christian, I'm going to call him Jeremy, said, I'm in distress. My dear friend Al at the office just died unexpectedly. And over the years of having lunch together and sharing work projects, I never shared the gospel with Al. And then Jeremy said, ah, you know, but, but Al did know that I was a Christian. And I suppose I did share my faith in that way. See, my response was, Jeremy, I know you're grieving now, and I I'm, I'm certainly don't want to add to your grief. But no one comes to Christ unless the gospel is explained to them. Just by telling them you're a Christian might not mean anything. You know, Al might have thought that you have to be born a Christian in order to be one. I mean, did Al know that what he might have done to become a Christian? Did Al ever tell you what he thought when he thought about God? See, of course, in truth, Jeremy didn't know how to begin a spiritual conversation. He didn't have an insight into the numerous starting places where one might begin. He thought he had to follow a formulized approach, and he just couldn't imagine sitting down with his friend and actually taking him through the plan of salvation. See, if only Jeremy could have understood that when Al worried about his kids, that was a starting place. He could have offered to pray for Al's kids and done it in front of him. Perhaps Al made a statement about wars in the Middle East, and Jeremy could have talked about the relationships of one's spiritual beliefs to personal conflict and his thankfulness that Christ had taught him to love his enemies. Perhaps Al might have wondered, what's happening to the world? Or why are things never turning out the way I want them to? Or a hundred other openings that open the door to the spiritual realm. See, for three weeks, I want to talk about apologetics and learning to defend your faith. We will find that when people enter into spiritual conversations, that all manner of questions arise. That's when people feel that they're not being preached to, but that they're being taken seriously, where there's a real dialogue about spiritual matters, and that we Christians may be asked hard questions, questions that take some insight and some thought and some time to answer. Now, of course, none of that's new. In the early church, all manner of misconceptions developed around the gospel, and these misconceptions kept some people from considering the claims of the faith. As you know, the Christian faith began among the Jews, and one of the first questions Christians had to respond to was this. If Jesus was the Messiah, how could he be defeated by the Romans and die on a cross? Doesn't the Messiah usher in the kingdom of God? How come he didn't do that, but was easily defeated by Pontius Pilate and the Roman government that oppressed Israel? Now, that's a great question, and an answer needs to be given. But there were other questions. How can Christians not make circumcision a necessity and still claim adherence to the faith of Abraham? Don't Christians disregard the law of Moses? Indeed, haven't you Christians abandoned Moses altogether? See, these were the moats that kept Jewish people from the castle. And as the gospel went out to the Gentile world, more questions and more misconceptions. Very early on, Christians were being charged with being atheists, and that sounds surprising to us. But that's because they refused to acknowledge the reality of the gods of the Greek and Roman pantheon. Were they atheists? Well, that was a moat. Then there was the question of belief. That is, when Christians celebrated communion that was known in those days as a love feast, a rumor began to circulate that what they were celebrating was an orgy. You know, then came the charge of cannibalism. Christians said that they ate flesh and drank blood at their love feasts. Who knew what evil things they did at these meetings? It was another moat, moat after moat after moat. See, I'm trying to give the impression that whenever the Christian faith moves out of our churches and enters into a real dialogue with people that live in a real culture, there are always going to be real questions, real challenges, genuine misunderstandings, 
And then to use the image that I've been using, there are real moats that prevent people from getting to the castle. And so for this week and the next two weeks following, we're going to be discussing some of those moats that prevent people from considering the gospel. We're going to try to hear the questions that people are asking and then answer those questions in an intelligent way that gives them access to the good news of Jesus Christ. As we enter a new ministry year of partnership with Back to the Bible India, we're excited about the progress and the impact being made on individual followers of Jesus, Christian pastors, and leaders. In the months ahead, we'll be partnering with Back to the Bible India to strengthen its online presence, including adding additional daily Bible teaching programs. This September, we'll be facilitating leadership training opportunities and beginning the process of organizing the next Bible teaching conferences for pastors and leaders led by Dr. Neufeld. So we're earnestly seeking your financial support. Your gifts go toward the $6,250 a month required to grow and sustain this important ministry partnership. Please prayerfully consider a generous gift this month or become an international monthly partner. Call us at 1-800-663-2425 or visit online at backtothebible.ca. A very serious charge that the first Christians needed to address was that Christians were anarchists and revolutionaries because they refused to pledge their loyalty to Caesar. That is, they would not proclaim that Caesar is Lord. Now, from the Christian perspective, only Jesus Christ is Lord. But that doesn't mean that Christians would not be good citizens, for they were committed to the belief that the governing authorities had been put into place by God. But from the non-Christian perspective, that looked different. When the time came for trade unions to meet in temples and, and pour out libations to the gods, including being involved in the cult of emperor worship, well, the Christians were absent. They refused to pledge loyalty to the state. This was a very dangerous charge, and it would soon bring the wrath of the Roman Empire down on their heads. Another motive, a very large one. Who wants to belong to a seditious group that was being suppressed by the Roman authorities? And so Christians always needed to provide non-Christians with answers that were designed to help them to understand the gospel. And as we have seen both in the Roman world and in the Jewish world, there were all manner of questions that Christians needed to answer until the questions were dealt with. Most non-Christians would not consider the gospel. And that's no different than our world today. Christians need to hear the charges that are brought against the Christian faith and the real questions that people are asking. Yeah, yes, yes, some questions are really just a guise for people who are looking for an argument. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So please notice the progression of thought. The Lord's servant, in presenting the gospel to others, starts with a basic premise. They're not quarrelsome. They're, they're not confrontive. They present the gospel to others. Although there may be confrontive people out there, that's not a description of God's people. God's people are not trying to win the argument. They're trying to win the person. Now, what they want is to assist those who are ensnared by the devil to escape that snare and to be led to the knowledge of the truth. You know, showing someone how wrong they are might win an argument, but it might not even do that. You know, there's an old adage that says that the man who is convinced against his will is of the same opinion still, and it's still true. Sometimes we might be able to show someone an error, but we might be so harsh in doing so that we lose him or her. At other times, we don't even win the argument because we have never listened or sought to be thoughtful. Now, in order to introduce this series, I'd like to begin a brief study of something that was written to believers by the Apostle Peter. The book of 1 Peter was written somewhere in the mid-A.D. 60s, and Peter writes this book in order to encourage Christians who are living in the north and the west of what was then called Asia Minor and what we now call the nation of Turkey. These people were beginning to encounter opposition. 
And when these Christians, who were largely Gentiles, first came to Christ, the first thing they did was they stopped worshiping gods of the empire. Now, this change of behavior was painful because, as we've seen, they were now viewed by many as being unpatriotic. But there was more. They also stopped worshiping the gods over their cities. And sometimes when there was a natural catastrophe, like an earthquake, the pagans charged that it was the Christians that had brought this on. And in response, people charged that Christians were turning against their own city, abandoning the gods' protection. But many of these new believers were also skilled tradespeople. And in those days, trade guild meetings were held at the temple in which worship of idols was a part. Now, these new believers were not there anymore, and the economic ramifications were instant. People were boycotting their shops. But there was more. Extended family gatherings also took place in pagan temples, and again, the Christians were absent. And what's fascinating is that many non-Christian people who attended the temple also didn't believe in the gods, but they came and offered token worship as a sign of civic allegiance, but the believers refused to do even this. They taught and believed what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 to 21. Now, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So they weren't eating in the temple anymore, and and the results were predictable. Social ostracism, insults, public shame, economic persecution. And as Christians were reeling in a world that thought them to be antisocial troublemakers, there were great moats that existed to prevent people from getting to the gospel, and Peter writes to believers to explain to them how that they should act. I'm reading 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Notice how important it is that believers place their hope in what is imperishable. If our first value is being accepted by the wider culture, we are already losing our way. Unless you value and earnestly long for that which is imperishable and unfading, you will always be seduced to long for acceptance from that which is perishable and fading. Furthermore, Peter says, this unfading inheritance is being guarded by God's power for those who trust in him. In other words, your final salvation is not in doubt. And then Peter adds another thought. You rejoice, that is, you are filled with joy at the anticipation of your final reward. But as we wait, we are also becoming increasingly aware that in the present hour we're suffering. But how? How are these believers suffering? So let's move forward to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. See, the day of visitation seems to refer to the day of the Lord's return, when the perishable things pass away, the things that are eternal, the great reward is made visible. But why would unbelievers glorify God on that day? Well, the answer must have to do with the winsomeness of believers. Some of those unbelievers are going to be one to Christ, and they're also going to rejoice. Now, on to 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And so in the midst of charges that they were rebels to Rome, don't you let those charges be true. Now on to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, 
always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. See, believers were to be fearless in the face of accusations and charges that were clearly meant to intimidate them. See, on the one hand, they were to make sure that the charges were not true. But on the other hand, they were to act fearlessly in answering the questions that people were asking. Have no fear of them, said Peter, even if they are capable of making you suffer. Honor Christ alone as Lord. Refuse to make a Lord out of your own personal safety. See, at the heart of all of this was that believers knew how to give answers to the people who asked. So for the next three weeks, I want to show how we today might do the same. Be gentle, but be fearless. Listen well, but answer well. Give a defense to all who ask and seek to win them to Christ as Savior and as Lord. This is the calling that each one of us has. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help God's people to be faithful in learning how to answer the honest questions that people are asking. In Christ's name we pray, amen. John, a great message and it's insightful. I want to mention a line you just used a few minutes ago. It said, on the one hand, they were to make sure that the charges were not true, but on the other hand, they were to act fearlessly. You know, I wonder, you know, with all the false accusations that I, I think we're all subject to in respect to being Christians, I wonder, though, if sometimes it's possible that we can become the moat that separates people from the kingdom or from the castle. Yeah, isn't that often the case? Uh, That's why you find, especially in 1 Peter, so often the warning that we are not to be a stumbling block, I think that's one way of putting it, but that we are not allow our behavior to be that which keeps someone from seeing the gospel. And so the behavior of believers, which is respectful to those with whom we disagree. I mean, that's such an important thing. I mean, I'm going to say it over and over again in this series, but when we come out in this hostile fashion in which we're going to prove to someone from the scripture that they're wrong, and that we're right. I mean, all that the person on the other side is hearing is intolerant, unwilling to communicate, unready to hear who I am. So if that's all they're hearing, yes, Ben, we are then the moat. And people are ending up saying, well, I don't know that I want to, you know, be a part of a group of people who have this kind of an attitude with those to whom they disagree. I think that's such an important question. Thanks so much, John. We look forward to the continuation of this series in the next weeks ahead. Back to the Bible Canada we teach the Bible. Gratitude, the quality of being thankful and readiness to show appreciation. Well, as part of the team at Back to the Bible Canada, we want to express our ready gratitude for your kindness. Your generosity during our June-July match campaigns exceeded expectations. He is a great God. Your partnership not only helped meet the fiscal year-end goal, but reinforced the presence of those across our nation who embrace a passion for Bible teaching. To express our appreciation, we want to send all of our listeners a free copy of the book, Family Worship. It's a wonderful tool that helps incorporate worship into the family home. So thanks, and stay with us as together we strive to champion the truth of God's Word. Call and ask for your free copy of Family Worship or offer a gift this month to support the ongoing ministries of Back to the Bible Canada at 1-800-663-2425 or visit backtothebible.ca.